This video is sponsored by Bespoke Post. This is the second in a series of videos about Simplex, a solid rocket motor that I designed, built, and fired over the last few months. In this video, we're talking about the components that make up solid rocket fuel and how to put them together. So let's get started. We're using a fuel in this motor commonly referred to as APCP, which stands for Ammonium Perchlorate Composite Propellant. The specific blend of this APCP that we're going to use is a formula called Cherry Lime. Let's take a look at some of the components, starting with the Ammonium Perchlorate. You might notice we have two types of Ammonium Perchlorate in here, 90 and 200. These numbers are in microns, they're the size of the particulate. Let's take a look at how this works with a little diagram. We're going to draw a zoomed-in cross-section of our rocket propellant, starting with the 200 micron AP. Even when we pack this volume as tight as it can go, there are still open spaces here. So we can get higher performance basically for free by adding the 90 micron AP in the spaces in between. These two particulate sizes mean that propellant is bimodal, and if we had three different particulate sizes, say 90, 200, and 400, that would be called a trimodal propellant. There are a lot of schools of thought as to how to size these different particulates in your ammonium perchlorate composite propellant, and oh, I'm so sorry, look at the time. It's time to get back on track. The next thing in our list is 7.5% of aluminum. The stuff we're using here comes in 30 micron sizes, so smaller than the smallest AP particle. This is gonna help us even further further by fitting in the little voids left by the space that the 90 micron AP can't fill. Aluminum can be considered our fuel here because ammonium perchlorate is a very powerful oxidizer, but it doesn't quite work like the discrete fuel and oxidizer setup that a lot of liquid engines have. The aluminum does burn, but the ammonium perchlorate also sort of burns on its own. Adding a metal like aluminum to a solid rocket motor can really increase its performance, and the combustion of that metal is usually a fairly complicated process. Specifically for aluminum, you actually want a longer motor. It's this very weird dependency where as the aluminum travels down, it needs a lot more time to burn than the ammonium perchlorate does. Generally, in larger rockets like the space shuttle rocket boosters, you'll see higher aluminum or higher metals content than in smaller hobby motors. Our propellant diagram is looking pretty good here, but if we don't add anything else, these particulates are just going to turn into a pile of particulates. We need this propellant to hold its shape. You might say we need to bind all of these particles together, and we're going to do that using a binder. Cherry Limeade uses a binder that comes in two parts, HTPB and modified MDI. HTPB stands for hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene, and it's basically like a rubber, and MDI is a polycarbodiamide modified diphenylmethane diisocyanate? I think I got it, I think I got it. I have the whole, I have the whole script up here and I'm pretty sure I got it right. Par polycarbodiamide modified diphenylmethane diisocyanate. I did it! Normally I would tell you that you shouldn't be scared of chemicals just because they have a long name, but you should be scared of MDI. That bad boy needs a respirator with organics cartridges. We'll also talk a little bit more about safety later, so we're gonna move on for now. These two chemicals, the HTPB and the MDI, work together like a two-part epoxy. You have the HTPB, which is the resin, and the MDI, which is the curative, or the hardener. These two liquids slip in to fill the voids between the particles in our diagram, and then once they solidify, they help this rocket fuel hold its shape. All right, let's finish this formula with the smaller parts now. Next up is 4.275% IDP, which stands for isodecal, iso, iso, isodecal polorganate. Come on, you gotta come up with better names for these. This is what's called a plasticizer, and it plasticizes the plasticity of the rocket fuel. I'm sorry. Basically, while the fuel is uncured and still a gray sludge, it helps things flow more easily. This gets you fewer voids and bubbles, and bubbles are always good to avoid. Once everything cures after casting, this IDP helps give the propellant a more rubbery feel, and it helps prevent things like cracks or overhardening. Finally, Cherry Limeade uses 0.3% castor oil, which actually makes the propellant a little bit stiffer, which 
which can help with some larger sizes of motors. Then we have 0.05% PDMS, which stands for polydimethylsiloxane. These, I'm telling you, these chemicals are crazy. <laughs> That's a scary name for a chemical, but it's basically a lubricant. And this is not actually for the rocket motor. It's another one of these little agents that helps us cast the rocket motor. It makes it easier to work with while the propellant is still a gray sludge. And the last thing on our list here is Triton X100, which is a surfactant or detergent. This is another thing that helps remove bubbles from the mix. And uh, especially uh, in some of those like smaller bonds within the HTPB, it helps open up those bonds and break the surface tension. So in a nutshell, that is what Cherry Limeade is made of, the rocket propellant, not the, uh, not the drink. This is one formula out of hundreds, maybe thousands, and people who really know what they're doing can take these different percentages, take the different chemicals involved, swap them out for different chemicals, change the percentages a little bit. If you really know what you're doing, you can use this formula as a jumping off point, but I do recommend just sticking to known formulas to start. Cherry Limeade has a whole set of ups and downs, but we don't really care about performance here. The thing that's important to us is making a motor and learning as we go. Something I've learned with making rocket propellant so far is that, especially for propellants like Cherry Limeade, the propellant is the process. The process is the propellant which means that you cannot just take these things, toss them in a bowl, hit mix, and you're done. Making rocket propellant is a step-by-step -step process that should be followed identical to the T every time so much as you can do it. The process totally affects the outcome of the propellant. We are about to get into the casting process for Simplex. I'm about to show you all about how that works, but first, a word from today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Bespoke Post. If you don't already know, Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club where each month you get a box of awesome. The boxes contain top shelf goods from small brands and it's totally free to join. Each box has around $70 in value, but you pay a fraction of that. And 90% of the products in Bespoke Post boxes come from small brands, many of which are based right here in the US. The good thing here is that you only pay for what you want. After taking a quiz about your preferences, each month you'll get a preview of what's inside the box before it ships, so you can decide if you want to swap or keep various products inside. And you only pay for what gets shipped. I've got a few boxes that came in the mail here, and let's take a look. This one is the Scorch Kit. Oh man, look at that. It's got all sorts of cool hot sauces. This one here is the Cold Brew Kit, which looks amazing. You've got a cold brew coffee maker here. This looks like some type of grinding stone. This is great. And this one isn't even a box. This is a chair that I'm sitting in, but we're not here to talk about geometry. We're here to talk about how you can get 20% off your first box. To get 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in the description and enter BPS Space 20 at check out or go to bespokepost.com slash BPS space 20. Thanks again to Bespoke Post for sponsoring today's video and now let's get back to it. So now it's time to make this rocket propellant and you already know what's coming. You know it, I know it. We got to talk about safety. Making a rocket motor is not the same level of safety as flying a rocket. This is a much higher level of safety and you need to be thinking way harder, like 10 steps ahead before you do anything like this. When you're processing rocket propellant, that is to say mixing and casting a rocket motor, the two big things you're worried about are personal protection and fire. We'll start off with personal protection. You're thinking about respirators with organic cartridges. You cannot be using those COVID-19 masks. Those are not gonna cut it. You need a proper organics cartridge that's going to actually filter out all of the particulate in the air. That is very important and you should double check anytime you put that respirator on that it is truly airtight. Eye protection. You wanna make sure through the whole process you're wearing some of these. They're super cheap. It is really easy to just put these things all over your shop and I cannot recommend it enough. You might think about ear protection. If you have a particularly loud mixer, you're gonna be listening to that thing mix for a whole long time. So think ahead, get some earplugs or earmuffs. Now onto safety thing number two, which is fire. There are parts of this that are obvious, i.e. don't mix next to a scented candle, and then there are parts of this that are not obvious. So I just wanna list some of those things that you might not think about. Most bowls for planetary mixers are stainless steel. So any other metal that you use in that process needs to not be stainless steel or any other type of sparking metal. Aluminum, brass, bronze, any other non-sparking metal is fine, but you can have no possibility of accidentally bumping two steel or iron things together, creating a spark and then burning half your face off. Static electricity is another one. If you're not properly grounded throughout the mix and you touch the side of the bowl, you can light up a bunch of AP in a way that you don't want. With electric mixers, you have a motor in there and there are a number of motors that create sparks when they work. Do you know how close your motor is to the bowl? Do you know how far those sparks can go? 
These are things to think about. And even after the mix, if you pour some of that AP in too fast, if you pour the aluminum in too fast, if you pour any of these things in too fast, you can create dust. The dust can settle around your shop and you've now created a fire hazard all over your shop. There are a lot of ways to create a fire here, so how do you put it out? You don't, you leave. A propellant fire is not a fire you can fight, it is a fire you can remove yourself from. So before you mix, before you do any of this stuff, you need to have an exit plan and you need to know your local and federal authorities to call if you have an emergency. A fire extinguisher is not going to work at all here. I am making these videos as a resource, they are not a tutorial. If you're starting to make solid motors and this is the only channel that you've seen or the only information you're getting about them, you're not getting enough information and you should seek it elsewhere. I strongly recommend working with at least one other person who has done this before a number of times before you mix your own propellant. Once again, I am actually trying to scare you. It's good to be scared of these things. Being scared will make you prepare harder and be more thoughtful about safety before it becomes a problem. All right, that's my safety disclaimer out of the way, now let's get to the mix process. I drove out to Colorado to Charlie Garcia's place to make this simplex motor. If I, yeah, if I remember correctly, bearings do this when they're really happy. Yeah, they, the bearings only do this like once in their life when they're extremely joyful. Which yeah. is a good time to mention that you should check your local and federal regulations on mixing rocket propellant. State by state, country by country, it's totally gonna be different wherever you go. So make sure you check those first. We started this mixing process by cleaning out all our mixing bowls and measuring cups to avoid contamination in the motor. I also got to work on cleaning the mix paddle that came with this old mixer Charlie had purchased from a pizza shop recently. We spent some time making a rotating hanging mount for the mix bowl so we could pour the 40 pounds of propellant into the motor without needing to hold the bowl ourselves. Final mixing prep included laying down mylar sheets on the floor to make cleanup easier and pre-measuring out the mix ingredients. This makes it easier because the timing and steps of the cherry limeade mix procedure are very rigid. You don't want to spend that time during your mix trying to measure out other ingredients. In terms of personal personal safety, some of these ingredients are a little less harmful than others, and there's no use taking a risk on which ones you have to wear a respirator for, so as soon as we cracked open that first bottle, we put our respirators on. Some of the ammonium perchlorate shows up just a little bit clumpy, so I also sifted through it to remove as many clumps as I could. Often this process is done with a sifter or screen to make sure you're only getting the right size particulates. As we went, we also notated the exact weights we achieved when measuring out the ingredients. In high performance motors, keeping track of the actual actual exact weights that you measured out is important. Obviously, you want the exact weight to the point, but just in case you don't get it and something goes wrong down the road, having a record that shows that you mixed a little bit off this time is very helpful. Just before we started the mix, we noticed that the mix paddle, which came with Charlie's used mixer, did not actually fit. Real quick, I want to check and make sure that this, yeah. oh, the bowl needs to go up another three quarters of an inch and it's hitting the, wow. Do you want to move back to the other beater? We may have to. It was too large to rotate through the mix bowl, so we switched to a dough hook instead. This would have been an excellent time to consider that the dough hook would do a significantly worse job blending all of the components together than the mix paddle, but we didn't think about that and we moved forward. We started the mix with the HTPB, making sure to scrape as much in as possible to reduce losses, and then we added the IDP as well and began the mixer. Next up, we began slowly adding the aluminum powder, one plastic cup at a time. It's important to not just dump these powders in because it makes mixing things together more difficult and can create dust, which causes a fire hazard down the road. After adding the aluminum, we ran the mixer for a while, then added the castor oil, PDMS, Triton X100, and mixed again. Even though the dough hook wasn't doing the best job combining things here, you want this mixing to be as thorough as you can get it. The goal is to create a fairly homogeneous liquid with that aluminum powder just suspended in it, plus added benefit, it's also mesmerizing to watch. At this point, we've reached the end of what we would consider our liquid premix, which means that it's time to pull vacuum. We take this mix bowl out of the mixer, put a vacuum lid on top, and then pull as much air out as we can. And we do this because it can suck out the little tiny air pockets within this liquid. The goal here was to get maybe 27 or 28 inches of mercury, but the pump wasn't quite powerful enough, or we may have had a leak somewhere. Another helpful thing you can do during this process is agitating the mix, which means moving the liquid around a little bit to expose some of those lower layers to the vacuum that it wouldn't otherwise see. Then, after carefully letting the air back in without creating more bubbles, we put the bowl back in the mixer and started adding the ammonium perchlorate. 
This happens in short batches for the same reason as the aluminum. We do not want dust or clumps, so we go slowly and carefully. We add it a bit at a time, folding it in a little, then mixing for a minute or two before adding more. We start out with the 200 micron AP here, and then we'll add the 90 micron AP after. Once the 90 micron is in, we mix this for a good long while. The goal is again to create a very homogeneous substance. Then the final step after this segment is to add the MDI, which is the curative, as you might remember. This is where time really starts to count. This is our last component of the mix, and the second we put it in is the second that it starts reacting with the HTPB and hardening the propellant bit by bit. It's also worth noting that with mixers like these, it's good to pause one or two times throughout the mix segment to get a plastic spatula so that you can get in there and scrape the walls. It's a little bit too easy for unmixed segments to remain on the side or bottom of the bowl if you don't do this. Once this was done, I scraped down the dough hook and we moved it over to the table to pull a vacuum on the propellant so we could remove those bubbles. One tricky part of this process is that as you pull vacuum on the propellant, the propellant gets larger. In order to combat this, you have to slowly pull vacuum as the air escapes so that the propellant doesn't touch the vacuum lid. And that would be very bad because if the propellant touches the vacuum inlet, it can get sucked right into your vacuum pump and propellant does not belong in the vacuum pump. This is also around the point that we started to notice the propellant was a little bit less flowy than we wanted. A rocket propellant can be considered pourable or packable or anywhere in between. Pourable propellants like these flow smoothly from the bowl into the rocket motor, and packable propellants usually require grabbing chunks of the propellant from the bowl and shoving them into the tube. The pourability of a propellant can depend on a ton of different factors. It can depend on your metals content, your solids loading, it can depend on the quality and or type of your curative, you can depend on the temperature, it can depend a little bit on the humidity, it can even depend on like the actual subscale shape of the AP particles. Like consider that a sphere is gonna roll past a sphere more than a square is gonna roll past a square. Oh, I am so sorry. Uh, it looks like it's time to get back on track. At the time, we weren't sure what step we messed up to turn this propellant into more of a packing situation, but we do know that the temperature on the day was cold, we used a dough hook instead of a mixing beater, and the MDI we used may not have been the top shelf stuff. And frankly, there could be plenty of other reasons, but our time for troubleshooting was pretty much gone and we were on the clock to pack this motor. As I mentioned earlier, our initial intention was to pour this propellant from the bowl into the motor, but as you can see, there was no way that was happening. The MDI was working quickly to harden the propellant, so instead of pouring it, we lowered the bowl to the ground, started grabbing chunks with our hands, and putting it in the tube manually. Also, quick sidebar about casting prep. We're putting this propellant directly into the liner of the rocket motor, but often people will load propellant into casting tubes. Those casting tubes then get glued into the liner, and then the liner goes into the case. The liner is an eighth inch walled tube with an outer diameter of 5.75 inches, which means that it should fit right into an eighth inch wall case with an inner diameter of 5.75 inches, right? Wrong. The liner I used was one that Charlie found willy-nilly on eBay, and the tolerances aren't really known on this, so it showed up a little bit bigger than we thought. And the case is just raw stock material, so the tolerances on that straight up don't exist. Unfortunately, this meant the liner did not fit inside the case, so I did the sketchiest thing I could possibly do, and I stuck my eBay liner on my eBay lathe. I mean, it was basically an eBay match made in heaven. I turned down section by section of the liner until I got it to fit snug inside of the case, and I did this all before we mixed or cast any propellant. In case it's not obvious, if you run into the situation and you've already cast the propellant, turning it down on a lathe is a terrible idea, so you're about to get really good at hand sanding. With the liner turned down to size, I used my favorite CAD program, Onshape, to start modeling up some casting hardware. I have the finisal shape here, and I want to call out two things. One is that we have a chamfer at the top to keep the propellant from having an aggressive overhang inside the motor, and two, we actually taper the fins and core a bit. This was in an effort to help with the extraction of the mandrel and finisil casting hardware, which we will see in a little bit. I made a bottom plate to fit flush against the finisil section, and a support for the mandrel up top, a little cone for the top of the mandrel, and a funnel to guide the propellant into the liner. This was before we realized that this was going to be a packable propellant, not pourable. I prepped the cylindrical core of the motor with increasing grits of sandpaper and then some aluminum polish to finish it off. I also sanded the crap out of the finisil section. Down to a microscopic level, the smoother your casting hardware is, the easier it will be to extract later down the road. Finally, earlier in the casting day, I had sanded and wiped down the liner in acetone to promote bonding of the propellant and coated all removable casting hardware in stoner E236 mold release to prevent bonding of the propellant. As Charlie and I were scooping propellant into the liner, we realized after 
a few minutes that we should probably be tamping this down. The propellant is going to sag under its own weight, and open voids will eventually smooth out. But with a packable propellant like this, those air bubbles have nowhere to go, so they'll stay there and create voids, which is maybe a little bit of foreshadowing. We tamped as we went with a rod, and once the motor was filled to the brim, we let the propellant cure for about 48 hours. After this, it was time to remove the casting hardware, starting with the Finisil seal on the bottom, which needed, ah, uh, some convincing to remove. Is it coming out? No. Right. We just, we delaminated it right at the corner. Yeah. I would just pop it all off now. Okay. It turned out to be important. Oh, nice. Wow. Dude. Hey. Then we had to get the mandrel out, which is pretty tough. Even with that mold release, even with the taper on the finisil, it's still very difficult to remove this piece of hardware. I had the bright idea to just drop the motor upside down, and it seems to work fine. How, how I'm thinking I do this, okay. and I keep my arms like this, and then I just drop it. So I'm we're going to start with like six inches. Yep. You ready? Yep. Okay, let's go up a little more. Okay. Hey, that worked! That moved. Dude, you were right. Oh my god! It's doing it! Oh! Uh! After pulling it out the rest of the way, we realized there was a very large problem. Actually, it was like closer to 15 to 20 large problems. Okay, I'm gonna hold it down. Ah. Oh my gosh, it's really not falling under its own weight. It needs me. Yep, okay. You're out. These voids in the propellant are very bad news. Voids increase your surface area, and the surface area doesn't necessarily even out after you hit a void, so they can drastically change the thrust profile of your motor. And if you have a ton of voids, it's gonna be hard to not have a runaway motor. In other words, you're probably gonna have a bad day. The good news is that the top of the motor looked great. Tamping the propellant cleared basically all of the large voids after the finisil section. So the question is, can we still fire this motor? The answer is yes, and also no. And it's no, because in its current form, the motor is kind of like a... It's like... The thrust gird would look nothing like the simulation. That finisil section is a proper disaster. So what if we just get rid of the finisil section? Since we haven't made the nozzle yet, we can still change the geometry of all the other parts of the motor to fit this new core geometry. If we simulate this motor without the finisil section, we don't get that nice flat curve, but we get a straight progressive burn profile, which is good enough here. Remember, the goal isn't performance, it's just to learn. So that's what I did. I lopped off the finisil section of the motor and we burned that extra section without a case or nozzle at far to get rid of it. We're gonna talk a lot more about chopping off that section of the motor and putting all the parts together in a later video, but that just about covers it for the propellant mixing and casting. I mentioned this before, but I'm gonna say it one more time. Following these videos step by step is not a good idea. This is not a tutorial, and by watching this, you do not know all the things you need to know. That said, here are some suggestions for other resources you can learn from. You can look through the Rocketry forum, you can look through the Rocketry subreddit, basically anything from Richard Naka. You can go to the NTRS server and search around for papers from NASA, and I still maintain that your best resource is people. Sign up for Tripoli, sign up for NAR, start going to launches and talking to people. Even for NAR, which doesn't allow experimental motors like this, you're gonna end up meeting a lot of people who can probably help you, and if they can't help you, they probably know someone who can. I can't teach you all of the things you need to know in order to do this safely through a YouTube video, and it's not because I'm not trying, it's because it's a YouTube video. So there are lots of ways to do this safely and responsibly. Anyway, next up we're going to talk about making the nozzle for Simplex, and I am particularly excited for that because there's a lot of very pretty machining footage in there. And as before, if you can't wait until I publish that video, all of these like once every two week updates are on the BPS Patreon linked below, and you can watch those right now if you want. Anyway, thanks to Bespoke Post for sponsoring this video. Thanks to you for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.